Welcome everyone to season four, episode 126 of the Premier Pod. I'm your host, Yashbika, joined by my co-host, Tyler Chan. And this episode, we got a pretty crazy one because this past weekend, there were some pretty crazy big blows that happened in the title race early on in the Premier League. Um, so to get things started, we're going to jump straight into the Chelsea-Manchester City matchup, uh, where Chelsea actually ended up, be- or excuse me, Man City ended up going into Stamford Bridge and beating Chelsea 1-0, getting their revenge from the Champions League final. Um, that dreaded result that all City fans probably will want, will want to forget. But they did get one up over Tuchel. Pep finally unlocked the game plan to beat him. But it was the first big blow in the title race because Chelsea and Liverpool, they did meet earlier in the season, but it was a draw. So every all the top four teams were essentially neck on neck. And then this one, City finally beat them. And they've kind of basically put the first blow in the title race. And this game was interesting because I was actually, during this game, while this game was on, the Manchester United Aston Villa game was on. So I was paying attention to the United Villa game, obviously, because I, I support United. But um, from this game, from what I've been hearing from other people that, uh, you know, that watched it, that broke it down, is Chelsea sat back like crazy in this one. They were very, very defensive, um, defensive to the point that it was almost detrimental to the entire team. And I know with Tuchel's system, Tuchel prioritizes being very defensive. We've seen it already where he likes to sit back, you know, likes to hit on the counterattack. But this game, for some reason, he was very on the defensive side. And they were also without Mason Mount. Reese James actually got injured uh, midway through the game. So that was a big blow for them. But very odd type of formation tactics that Tuchel put out. And then for Pep Guardiola, he had Bernardo Silva just running the show as a midfielder and then Gabriel Jesus coming up with the clutch goal for him. They were missing a number nine and Gabriel Jesus, the number nine um, pulled up for him, but it was a huge result for Pep Guardiola because he finally uh, got one over um, Thomas Tuchel. It was a big storyline just based on the commentators too. They kind of opened it up as the champions of Europe versus the champions of England. And if you don't really follow soccer, that doesn't really make sense. (laughs) It's like, wait, isn't England in Europe? But Basically, it was the title winners versus the Champions the, the League. Title winner, yeah, the Champions League winner. So, <laughs> Premier League title versus Champions League trophy winner. And this game, I mean, it had the potential to be kind of high scoring, but also at the same time, kind of meh, kind of like the 1 0 scoreline that you see just because both teams are so good defensively. And that's basically what happened. As you just kind of mentioned, Chelsea set up shop. They went 3 5 2 formation and then decided, you know what? We're just going to let. Man City pepper us, and then we'll try to get him on the counterattack. But I feel like that tactic doesn't work on Man City. Every time I've seen a team upset City or pull a way to get a result against City, maybe it'd be a draw or just at least a few goals, it's from disrupting Pep Guardiola's kind of high press and possession heavy pass offense, where if you don't let them play their game, they can't really be as effective. If you don't have their players kind of running along the sides and kind of bombing in from the wings into the middle or having Kevin De Bruyne being able to just set up shop and just play like QB, play like a quarterback and just pass to whoever. Mm -hmm. If you just stop them from being able to do that, or maybe as often, or maybe at at their own tempo, then that's how I feel like City can be stopped. And I mean, you already seen a little bit of glimpses of that from the season already because City didn't have as great of a start to the season. Granted, it's only been four or five games but, I mean, those points all matter at the very end. Like We've seen games kind of determine the ultimate final standings from just one or two points from the past several seasons. So I feel like Chelsea, they gave them a little too much respect. I feel like Chelsea should have played to their game that they usually have where they do like a 3-4-3 and they just go very attacking. It put City on the defense at times and also kind of give them some second thoughts. But for City, it was basically just pretty dominant from them for the most of the game. Like Mm -hmm. Chelsea were kind of just on the back foot. And even at times, Thiago Silva had to make goal line clearances, things like that. But I feel like Chelsea, they they kind of they kind of messed up on this one. Like the tactics usually from Tuchel are pretty set and sound, but this this one was quite the fumble. It's Yeah, they 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 were missing they were missing for some big players for sure. Then today it was actually announced that Angolo Conte tested positive for COVID nineteen, so he's going to be out for their Champions League match and their Southampton game coming up this weekend. So that's a big blow for them. But it there was a point where Ruben Diaz also made a huge block in the in the game. Um, and I remember seeing somewhere someone put out a tweet that Lukaku was just basically on an island. He just could not do anything because there was no service being put to him. And 
you know, like you said, I, I think it's just very odd that Tuchel went so defensive because usually, as you said, Man City, yeah, you have to play on the counterattack, but I've seen when Wolves have upset them, when Manchester United have come into the Etihad to beat them, yeah, they did sit back a majority of the time, but there were 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes of uh, different spells where, you know, the team actually high-pressed them or actually went on the front foot and tried to give them a little bit of a... um, as I would say, a little bit of a push, and that kind of frightened the Man City players and pushed them a little, pushed them around a little bit, and kind of threw them off their game. But you know, you have to give kudos to Pep because Pep, you know, he he got his stuff right. He finally got one over him, um, you know, after that Champions League defeat. So City, I will say, you know, they deserve credit because they came into the Stamford Bridge, which is a hard place to come into, especially under Tuchel, and they got a one nil result. Which you know, you never know. Come down to the end of the season, it may be that win that maybe takes them that takes them over Chelsea or helps them win the title. So it was a huge result for uh, uh, Manchester City. But moving on to a team like the other big game of the weekend, crazy that we got two of these big ones in one weekend, but it was a North London derby. It was Arsenal versus Tottenham. It was at the Emirates. It was a up and coming Arsenal team versus a Tottenham team that were struggling, missing some key players, haven't won a game in a couple games. But what a game it was because Arsenal came in um, came into the Emirates and just rocked Tottenham. Came out with an early 3-0 lead in the first half. And then the second half, I would say, they kind of went off the pedal a little bit, allowed Tottenham to get back into the game. You know, Tottenham did score a goal, and it was an Aaron Ramsdale incredible save at the second half that did kind of keep um, Tottenham from keeping scoring that second goal. But overall, it was a dominant Arsenal display. Aubameyang scoring the second goal. And basically, after he scored a second goal, recreated Terry Henry's iconic celebration where he just goes on a knee slide and just kind of holds his head up high where he's just like i'm the man i'm the man for arsenal and it was kind of crazy because thierry Henry was actually at the game too being able to witness that so you know you had emil smith rose scoring you had um Obama yang scoring you had Saka scoring you had the whole front line working in tandem um tomiyasu was a absolute star wolf like just a Beast of a defender at right back. Ben White and Gabriel look solid defensively. Ramsdale coming out with some big saves. Um, Kieran Tierney on the left side, solid left back. It was almost, you know, they said it in the announcers, but that game was kind of what you would think of Mikel Arteta. That's probably the picture-perfect game plan of what a Mikel Arteta, full-fledged Mikel Arteta side will look like when they're pr- producing at a, such a high level. And that was one of the few times I've seen Arsenal buzzing where the game plan worked correctly and also the whole stadium and the vibes were just buzzing like a good vibe all around that's one of the few times I've seen Arsenal kind of feel like that in the past couple of seasons because it's it's been a tough time for Arsenal fans but that was definitely one of the uh, one of the best displays I've seen at the Emirates especially from an Arsenal team in such a long time mm-hmm. and you can tell from just Mikel Arteta's celebrations that yeah. relief the happiness that he just kind of <laughs> fist pumped into the into the stands it was insane i was like man this is someone who's definitely on the hot seat and then finally (laughs) a little bit of ice to put on that bum Mm -hmm. but geez this arsenal side they came out like explosive they came out when i watched this game it was pretty early in the morning at least for me it was like 11 (laughs) 30 so 11 30 a.m eastern standard time but watching the game i was kind of like a little dazed and i was just like is this on times two speed like what is going on like yeah, this, they were all over they, the place. They played so fast to the point where, yeah, as Yash mentioned, they were three 0 up by halftime, a result that you wouldn't think Arsenal could get in the North London derby if you were to look at this team at the start of the season. Because you know, going into this game, both teams they had it flip flopped in terms of their form. Tottenham yeah. had a hot start and then cool off really quickly, whereas Arsenal had one of the coldest starts that we've seen <laughs> in a while, and then now. They, like they picked off some of the relegation zone teams and that momentum carried into this game and straight off the bat that team momentum basically draw them, drew them up and made Tottenham look pretty subpar like Arsenal yeah. after beating Tottenham this game are now above them in the table <laughs> and only on top of that they still kept those young stars those young rising not stars like that's a little terrible to say but those young rising prospects that Mikel Arteta put so much faith into that yeah. now they're playing in the North London derby and you, those players like Ramsdale, Ben White and Tomoyasu those players are now looking like staples and yeah. 
I talked to a few of our good friends. I listened to the podcast, also featured on the podcast, like Sung Hoon Cho. I asked him about these transfers actually over the weekend. And Cho in particular kind of highlighted Aaron Ramsdale, or as he calls him, uh, Godsdale, because he has a lot of faith in, in Ramsdale. He gave you a few notes. He was like, you know, because of his passing and because of just his confidence in himself, uh, Aaron Ramsdale has compared to Burnt Lano, whereas Burnt Lano has just been like sliced for the past couple seasons. That confidence has been taking a hit, whereas Ramsdale is coming in kind of full, kind of sunny, looking in with all the passion that he has. And that's really built up a lot of basically support from the Arsenal fans. There's like the Arsenal fans have really gotten behind him. And I, that maybe has gotten given him a little bit of a boost. And that's why he's been doing a little better. But even in this game, you kind of shown the passing ability of Ramsdale where I didn't really recognize it until it was kind of pointed out to me. He's like, no, you should, you should see the passes. They're, they're not too bad. I'm like, all right, all right, we'll, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. And then some of these passes are actually pretty on point. Like there'd be times where it'd be like a risky pass, but because it was perfectly time, perfectly on target, it was there. And there are times where he would be smart enough to draw defenders away from certain defenders or midfielders that he's trying to mm-hmm. pass to by just, you know, placing the ball down in certain directions and he was smart enough to just lure people out like that. So like kind of certain tactics like that are things kind of the intangibles that you don't really think about with Ramsdale that I didn't really think about too much now too, but starting to grow on me a little bit just because the Arsenal yeah. fans are getting a little, they're getting into my head a little. And also Enrique kind of one of our good friends and listeners, Enrique kind of mentioned to me too. He just kind of said the exact same things with Ramsdale. I was like Ramsdale too. It's like, everyone's just talking about Ramsdale. Yeah. And he's I mean, been a- He's been a catalyst because um, with Burton Leno, I know a lot of Arsenal fans were hit and miss on him. I think, actually, if you talk to a lot of Arsenal fans, they're kind of fed up with him because he did go out of confidence a lot. And he also could not play the way Mikel Arteta wanted to play in terms of playing out the back. Um, he was not very comfortable with his feet. And sometimes his positioning and just his overall ability kind of lets him down sometimes. And I know with Ramsdale, he did. I, I remember watching the game. He was able to perform some of those slick passes that Aderson was able to play, not in terms of the long ball, but more of the short passes where you're just able to ping it in perfectly. Um, and that's really valuable, especially in this day and age, and especially the Mikel Arteta way where he's kind of resembling Pep Guardiola. You need a goalkeeper that will pass the ball to your midfielder, but actually pass it where the midfielder can control it in turn and not just you know bullet a pass into them where they have to take a heavy touch and all of a sudden the other opponent is in in through goal because the goalkeeper can't make a a you know a 10 15 yard pass and Ramza was making a ton of those I remember the second goal actually the Aubameyang goal where you know people could say oh was it a foul on Granite Xhaka they didn't call it but Ramsdale passes into I believe Xhaka he gets the ball turns it puts it out to Tierney Tierney gets it plays it to Emil Smith row Smith row puts it passes it back to Aubameyang Aubameyang to a Smith row and then plays him in again and then Aubameyang scores so it was a perfect counter-attacking goal that resembles sort of the way Man City plays sometimes where they can literally start from the goalkeeping position. The goalkeeper, Aderson, passes it to the center back. Center back just goes through the midfield and then boom, they're through on goal and score. And it it was just a perfect example of what Mikel Arteta wants this project to look like. And I remember during the post-game interview, he actually mentioned that, uh, I think a reporter asked him, so is this what you wanted to, is this what the project, it's supposed to look like and he was just really giddy and just super excited because he can tell now that he has the players uh, coming back from injury Thomas Partey especially those key players kind of coming back from injury and now he's got a solid group of young core players he can kind of kick on and you know you can kind of see where he wants to take the team and I think what's also interesting I remember when they lost the city when they were on that three game losing streak I, I went on the podcast I was like these next three games are really important for Mikel Arteta's error at Arsenal because if he can get three out of three he can start building up some really good momentum that really kick on um, from the season because they had a really tough schedule but you know kudos to Mikel Arteta because he's won three out of three and basically capped it off with a brilliant display in the North London Derby uh, but I, I wanted to mention real quickly to a couple other players Thomas Partey I haven't you know, the times he has played and looked in form at Arsenal, he looks like a million dollars. I mean, he's such a good midfielder in terms of breaking up play, um, just being that very commanding force, has the ability to pass, is so technical on the ball. Kind of on, honestly, the idea, ideal central defensive midfielder that Manchester United need, Arsenal have. And hopefully if he can stay healthy, he can be a really key player for them. But Tomiyasu is a kind of a stalwart, stalwart and kind of a catalyst for Arsenal's defense because 
he came in on transfer deadline day and you know people were just like oh why did they why did they buy this guy and he comes in from Bologna from the city A. he comes in and has just cemented his place at right back Be- basically a, a huge upgrade over Hector Bellerin he can get up and down the pitch he shows some of that leadership ability that you would like to see in a def- you know on one of your defenders he's very commanding there and i remember there were certain times during the games where instead of maybe passing it back in terms of maybe passing it out of the back, in terms of taking a risky pass, he just kind of boots it away. And I think Arsenal players, especially on the defensive side of the ball, have kind of lost that for the past couple of years. They've kind of lost the ability to just boot the ball away. They're kind of like, oh, I got to pass it out. And then they end up leading to a mistake. So he's got that sense that, okay, if it's in a little bit of danger, I can just boot it out and then we can figure out another way to pass around. So there's little signs like that where the team is looking like it's maturing. Um, and look, looking like an actual Arsenal side, and you know, you know, if I'm an Arsenal fan, I'm buzzing after this result because it's just it, the good vibes haven't been there for so long. Mm-hmm. And also, just from Yoshi's descriptions of just trying to describe goals from audio, <laughs> audio cues, <laughs> you're starting to see a lot more one and two touch football again that you kind of mm-hmm. saw from the staples that you saw with Arsenal under Wenger, where it's just very quick counterattack, very quick kind of movement and playmaking with the ball. And this wouldn't be able to happen unless you had players that are comfortable on the ball and can actually supply the pass. And that's why you got players like Ben White in the team now, or his nickname, apparently Benny Blanco. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) And also even players that we'd even mentioned, like Odegaard, one of the key playmakers in that. Yeah, he was was huge. I remember seeing him press the uh, Hugo Lloris a lot, especially during... When uh, Tottenham had the ball, he was one of the key factors in terms of pressing, like high pressing mm-hmm. for Arsenal. And then on top of that, they have so much basically prospect depth now. The You know, like Lakonga, who started the, the past few games, he was on the bench. He's been pretty solid so far, just being able to run that midfield, according to Cho. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I'm still like, ah, I, I still need a little bit more time. And also just on top of that, certain players like uh, Traveas, and on the left side, right behind Tierney, you had a little bit of that like kind of carbon copy of certain players just ready to go. But I still think it's still a little too early to see how this Arsenal side truly is because yeah. a three-game stint where two of the teams are relegation and then one is a Tottenham <laughs> team that's slightly on the decline for yeah. form at the moment. It's It might be a little bit of fool's gold, but yeah. it's pretty promising to finally see some sunshine and a lot of darkness for a while for Arsenal. And I think it's some good things to take away from in terms of just bringing momentum and also just showing from Mikel Arteta's perspective. It's like, you know, this project, it could actually work. We got the players. We just got to keep this momentum going and also just continue to build that chemistry. So it's a pretty promising outlook, but we'll have to see. I need more samples. It's only been like five games. And for half of them, it's been like kind of bleak. <laughs> so. Yeah. We need a lot more successful samples for us to really confirm the Arsenal backup. But for this one kind of isolated incident, it's been pretty good, especially against the North London rival Tottenham. Yeah. And just to kind of go through Tottenham real quick, too, they didn't look great. Like Kane, he was brought back this season just to be a focal point to hopefully get them back into the Europa League or at least any European competition, not hopefully not the Europa Conference League again. Ideally, it'd be Champions League, but there's no way at this point. But Kane hasn't scored yet in the champ- or in the Premier League, which is pretty surprising. And Sun looks like the main focal point at this point, like the one point of that attack where there's a little bit of hope, or like a little bit of glimpse where it's like, if something's going to happen, it'll probably be through Hung Min Sun. Mm-hmm. But I'm surprised. Like, Kane came back during his prime. I mean, he didn't really have a choice, but he says he's going to go all in and pull like an Aaron Rodgers kind of last season kind of hurrah and see how he yeah. does but it hasn't really been clicking for him and i don't know yeah. yet. it's like it, what do you think about kane right now is it the tactics is it him is it a little bit of both yeah i think uh so what was interesting i think our or tottenham excuse me had basically two options during the summer they either go full rebuild where they sell harry kane maybe you know, I know Human and Son decided to sign the contract extension, but you sell Harry Kane, you get the funds for the money, then you maybe get a manager such as Graham Potter or, you know, an up and coming manager where they look like they have some pretty positive results and they could possibly build something that Mauricio Pochettino kind of did at Tottenham, you know, 
gosh, now it's probably six years ago when he first came into the club. But you go that route, but instead Tottenham decide to basically play hardball and keep Harry Kane because they didn't want to sell him. And they ended up trying to scramble away for, you know, they were trying to look for some top top class managers. You know, they had Antonio Conte, they had others along, but uh, unfortunately that just didn't happen because those managers saw the state of the club and were like, I don't know if this is kind of the project I'm going to go into. And they ended up having to pick Nuno, who unfortunately, I, I like Nuno, he's a good coach, but you know, you went from Jose Mourinho to Nuno Espirito Santo and in a lot of ways, Nuno is kind of the carbon copy of Jose Mourinho. He likes to play on the counterattack. He likes to play very defensive um, and he likes to score on the counterattack. He pr- prioritized defensive football first. So, and, and he's also Portuguese. So it's essentially Tottenham went from Jose Mourinho to a lesser version of Jose Mourinho with Nuno. And they decided, okay, we're going to keep Harry Kane. I know Harry Kane put out the statement that, hey, I'm all in, but really... Can you really trust that? Because this is also the same guy that put a price tag on his head and also essentially stopped coming to training because he wanted to leave the club and go to Manchester City. So in a sense, Tottenham kind of screwed themselves because now you have a player that essentially doesn't really have his heart in it this season because he sees all the big clubs, Manchester City, Manchester United, Chelsea, Liverpool. They're playing in Europe. They're playing in the biggest stage of uh, Champions League and Harry Kane's playing in the Europa Conference League, and he's also at a team that he knows. He looks around, and he's like, none of these guys can compete with the big four. There's just no way. Um, Maybe we may get the odd result here and there, but consistently speaking, this this team is too too thin. A lot of the stalwarts that were there when he was there, such as Christian Eriksen, Toby Alderweireld, Jan Vertonghen, um, others of the same ilk are not there at the club anymore. So it's a brand new kind of fresh faces all over the place. And Harry Kane... The fact that he's struggling too also hurts Tottenham next summer because they're not going to be able to get the same 140 million that they were demanding because now, you know, you could get, I'd still say you probably get 100 million, but that extra 40 mil probably won't be there because if Harry Kane continues to struggle like he is right now, he's kind of essentially putting Alexi Sanchez because there are a lot of times where I'm watching the game and he's not really, it just, you can kind of tell, it doesn't look like he's giving his all. It's kind of like he's just kind of walking around you know, going 50%, going through the motions because he knows that, you know, if I get a big injury, that might cost me a chance to move out of the club. And also, you know, he kind of feels a little bit betrayed by the club. Like, why couldn't you honor my wishes? So a lot of ways he's kind of pulling an Alexi Sanchez where what he did with Arsenal, where, you know, that last season he was with Arsenal, he kind of just, you know, he was there, he showed his class a little bit, but most of the time he wasn't really giving his 100%. And I feel like Harry Kane's kind of at that same position where, you're good. You may get moments where you see 100% Harry Kane, but I feel like in totality, you'll probably only get 75, 60% of what Harry Kane can actually bring in terms of his on football pitch. And that's just unfortunate because, A, you're getting robbed of seeing a really good player perform at a high level. And also, the player also brings other players down because if you see your star player not really giving his all for the team, it's like, you know, if you're Lucas Moore, like, why should I even try? You know? So you, you're kind of stuck in a weird position and Nuno unfortunately yeah you know you could say he needs to be back more but i don't think nuno is the guy to build the project around at tottenham i feel like they should have went maybe the grand potter route or bring in a coach that kind of plays the tottenham way which is attacking football nuno unfortunately is not that i feel like nuno the the moves they made in the summer especially with nuno and others i feel like it was more of a band-aid to hopefully stop the water leaking instead of just you know accepting where they are and going full-on rebuild Mm mm-hmm and also doesn't help that Nuno is like the 20th choice in terms of yeah, manager. He was but, almost literally the last choice. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's like, please, just someone, <laughs> someone take over. <laughs> but this all kind of reminded me of a, a conversation I had with my, my mom recently where she's kind of roasting me. She was like, why is your generation so like disloyal to like companies? Like, why do you, why do all y'all leave companies after like two years? Something like that. During my generation, you know, she's like a little older. She's like, everyone kind of picks one company and they stay there for like their entire career. And it's like, for all y'all, it's like, you guys just hop around. So disloyal. But (laughs) I mean, I feel like this kind of scenario of like Harry Kane kind of reminded me of why people leave is because like Harry Kane, he has all these aspirations and all these kind of goals for wanting to play in Champions League. He's in his prime. He has his own trophy. Yeah, he wants to win a trophy. Whereas (laughs) at Tottenham, he's kind of committed for like years now like i i, I, I want to say almost like 10 years at this point where because like he was there since he was like almost a youth player like exiting youth 
like the academy things like that so mm-hmm. back when i don't even remember what number he wore it was like 18 something like that on the, yeah, the back of his wow, jersey yeah. <laughs> so i mean he's kind of given his time but the club is not really respecting him as you, know, you mentioned to kind of bring out the most of him kind of bring out all of his potential because now he's right now in his prime and his prime won't last forever so right now he's kind of just wasting away this one prime season of his career whereas if they really did honor him and really did respect him and maybe give a little bit of discount just to like kind of get him off the books then possibly he'd be doing a lot better and giving more effort than as of right now whereas you know this is kind of almost like when a player's in the final year of their contract where they know if they get injured they know if they have a bad season then that next contract that renewal is not going to come and yeah. for Harry Kane, it's like, it's not really a new contract. It's more like <laughs> just a permanent move somewhere else. So yeah. he knows if he gets injured, no one's going to pick him up. Like, no, you can't pick up an injured player unless it's like a really rare scenario where it's like, all right, maybe this player will come back. But for this case, you know, Harry Kane, he's kind of living up to that millennial kind of that era where it's like, you know, the company is not worth dying for, is not worth putting that 100% effort for because they're not really giving it back to him. So that's why he wants to leave. <laughs> And that's kind of yeah. how it is for like our generation too, because you know, it's kind of switched to the point where it's like the company's bigger than what like the player wants, mm-hmm. and now it's like nah, it's it should be on the individual to kind of focus on what's best for their own career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely that's like per- perfect analogy to kind of sum up what's going on with Harry Kane and Tottenham because um, someone put on Twitter that they could have they they could have chosen the serious route of you know going for Graham Potter, basically going full rebuild, but instead they chose to be unserious and go for Nuno and keep Harry Kane, who didn't want to be there. So, you know, you know, I wanted to quickly mention the Arsenal. Um, I think Arsenal, yeah, they did perform really well, but I think it's a young team, so there are going to be a lot of inconsistencies throughout the season, but Tottenham are a team that's struggling mightily right now, and yeah, I just don't think it's going to get any any better for Tottenham, at least for the time being, because they are in a struggle because Harry Kane is just not performing. Nuno can't get the best out of his squad, and they can't. They literally cannot stop conceding goals at this point. They just keep conceding three goals every game now. So a little bit unfortunate for Tottenham. They're kind of on a downturn. Arsenal on the upturn. But uh, moving on to Brentford versus Liverpool, which ended up being a really exciting game. I caught, actually, I think the last 10 minutes of it. Um, I, was, I was doing something that morning, but uh, it was a 3-3 game, um, a draw, exciting draw. Um, Salah scoring, which was great. Um, I think that's his 100th goal in the Premier League for Liverpool, which Mm -hmm. is a big milestone for him. I feel like he's been breaking milestones this entire season, um, which is crazy. But yeah, it was a a crazy game, (laughs) 3-3. It was a little surprising as a Liverpool fan to see Brentford kind of stay toe-to-toe with Liverpool. As you know, at the beginning of the season, you've seen Brentford kind of upset Arsenal kind of go along the way and kind of survive doing a little but more overachieving than you'd expect from a Brentford side. But I mean, all credit to them. They really did put in toe to toe and kind of believe and were brave with their tactics, as their manager said, I believe is their manager is Thomas Frank, something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But Thomas Frank. that show of this Brentford's tactics that really surprised me that I feel a little worried about, that they exploited on the Liverpool side was that they overloaded players on the wingbacks position. So, for example, what I saw that really got them two of their goals was they would put three players at the end of a cross, not spread around the entire you know goal box. Like if, say, a cross is coming in from the right side, usually you'd have three players kind of spread around, like maybe one on the front post, one in the middle of the goal, and then one... Like right in front, of, right in front of the goal where like the penalty spot is, and then one in the back post, so that you know if the ball goes in one of those three spots, at least someone's there. Instead, they put all three players on Trent Alexander Arnold, and they yeah. just chuck the ball to the back post, and they did that consistently, as if you're, if as if this was like the NBA like conference finals with like the 76ers and the and the Hawks, and you just kept fouling Ben Simmons because you know he can't shoot. Whereas for Trent Alexander Arnold, you know he can't win headers. So they put three of the biggest people around Trent just to like box them out. And then they would always chuck the ball around that area. And Brentford won the ball most of the time because of that tactic. And if Matip or Van Dyke were to assist Trent, then it would leave a space in 
the middle of the defense for someone from midfield to run into. It's kind of like a cheesy, easy <laughs> tactic just to talk about on high level. But in reality, that's what happened. Like even yeah. the mirrored version of that happened where they overloaded Robertson's side. And it made the Liverpool defense so poor to the point where all their goals were basically at times just unsavable. Ali's son had zero saves this game. And I can't really blame him because their opportunities were just like clear cut. Like their, their chances were a very low chance of a goalkeeper to save just because they had so much to aim for. <laughs> and, you know, at times they, get a, they got a little lucky with some of the bounces, but I was just a little surprised that Klopp couldn't have a tactic in mind, a tactical change near the end of the game to maybe help with that overload on the wingbacks. Whereas usually those wingbacks, Trent Alexander-Arnold and Andrew Robertson running up the wings is what stretches teams defensively and what stretches teams to kind of push back and not being able to defend those crosses and overload in the middle from Liverpool. Whereas Mm -hmm. Brentford did the reverse. There's like, you know what, let's just stop those sources of where these crosses and chances creator are coming from and just push them back and just overload those areas. And it worked. And I hope that (laughs) the film study from the other coaches don't look too much into that because I was like, man, we don't have a solution for that unless Klopp decides to put in another center back or maybe just another (laughs) right back and left back just to help to plant that. Or maybe a center mid that can kind of alternate between the two sides. But, Mm -hmm. you know, even with Fabinho playing center defensive mid to help with the defense, it wasn't enough. Like, it just felt like Brentford always had a man up or a man in the right position where another Liverpool defender was not in ready in time to block a shot or block a pass. Like it just looked like Brentford just one step ahead every time, which is yeah, just a little shocking for me. <laughs> we had yeah. Brentford as a team that kind of, they were kind of lucky to be up here in the first place in the Premier League, but you know, under exciting. Frank, it's, it's, uh, it's quite it, the shocker. It, it's it's quite the eye opener, I would say. Yeah. It's exciting though. The bees. Yeah, I remember um, when I caught the last 10 minutes of the game, there was one chance, I think, in the 90th minute where I, I I can't remember who was running 1v1, and then Van Dyke comes up with like a huge tackle to stop the 1v1, I, I believe. Um, and that was just crazy because I, I think it was like the last couple chances and Brentford were just going all out. Like They weren't settling for the draw. They wanted to figure out how they could win. And, and that was almost Leeds-esque where Leeds could have the draw, but they're more worried about how can we get the win instead of, most teams in that position, maybe if you're facing a Norwich, they'd probably be like, okay, how can we sit behind for the last five minutes and figure out how to s- settle for the draw? Which I kind of like. I like that the promoted team is just kind of going for it because I remember Bournemouth, when they first came to the Premier League, they were kind of like that as well, where, you know, they were the very young, fresh, exciting side that, you know, had no fear, essentially. They beat Chelsea, they beat Manchester United. I remember in back to back games. And the way they did that was just, not settling for draws. They try, they just tried to go in there and try to win or figure out ways they could score goals on them. And when you do that with the big teams, it kind of catches them off guard because I feel like, you know, no matter who the manager is, when you play for a big side, there is a little bit of an arrogance that comes with you because you're like, you know, we're the big, bad Liverpool, Manchester United, City, Chelsea, you know, we can walk in and, you know, score on whoever we want, especially with a newly promoted side. So I like that they kind of went for it, but it was an exciting game. But I guess, Tyler, for one thing that was good was that all the other top four teams essentially dropped points or City, they caught up with everyone else. So it wasn't mm-hmm. a too detrimental of a draw because if Chelsea had won, it obviously would have put things in a, a much different perspective, but kind of a good week to drop points if you're Liverpool. Yeah, everyone decided to just drop the ball, unless you're Man yeah. City. But Almost yeah, every top was... team in Europe, too. A lot mm-hmm. of top teams that struggle. And, and it's true, actually. Weekend. Kind of an off weekend. I wonder what happened. Yeah. <laughs> but I also did want to quickly mention, too, ones. just Ivan Tony, The strike for Brentford, he was basically the main focal point last season where he scored 33 goals and assisted 10, if I remember correctly. But mm-hmm. he's continuing to do that in the Premier League. He's yeah. very much a... Mm, I don't know what the right analogy is, but like it, he clearly stands above the rest, where it's like when he is up front and the camera's all on him. It's like you can clearly see and pick out in the crowd which one's Ivan Tony. And mm-hmm. then when he's on the ball, he kind of makes things happen. Where I feel like this... I mean, I don't want to be too early because last time I did this, it was with Timo Puki. And I was like, mate, this guy's... <laughs> this He's something different. But Ivan Tony, I, I kind of see it. It's... He's kind of had a, a little bit more surprising of a playmaking ability. He kind of reminds me of like a... 
if you were to go into FIFA and then you were to just put a super tall player and try to max out stats where it's like, you know, I want a really tall playmaker and you have to score goals, just put him at striker, something like that. That's Ivan Tony. Like he scores goals, he's confident, he's able to do everything that this team asks for. And I feel like this is a telltale sign for Brentford. You might lose him next season. Like this guy's too good to be at <laughs> Brentford. I'm not gonna lie. But yeah. I mean Brentford have they've they've done a good habit of selling having good players and selling them off to Premier League teams like Neil Malpe, Ollie Watkins. So it's not mm-hmm. uh it's not too out of the blue. It's true, but I mean, it, it is a big focal point of Brentford. I don't know if they can just recover if they were to sell a certain player like that. But, mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like this is a kind of a hot take. But I think Brentford, they can stay in the Premier League for next season at this rate. Yeah. Because their tactics, they're just playing such brave football that I can't see them dropping that many points. I see them upsetting more teams than, than not. So, yeah. I mean, I had them. I had them getting relegated, but you know, it's early in the season. But they have they have shown like good flashes of like that they can stay in the league. That they're maybe a bottom half team, or maybe they could reach up to the mid table if they get lucky enough. Mm-hmm. So, because systemically and just on stats alone in terms of goals scored, they're pretty impressive. And also, just from the Liverpool perspective, yeah, Liverpool missed a few chances that could have been put away, like Diogo Jota missed from basically two feet away it was kind of harder to miss at times <laughs> for some of these chances but i mean kudos to brentford for even keeping the keeping them out or just making the man miss just from a mental game or just kind of posting a player in a certain spot so they're doing all the right things and it's all those like little things that can keep you in the league and yeah. i was kind of surprised to see brentford do all that that's i guess that's the key takeaway from this is brentford is not to be messed with they're not just like a one-off surprise kind of team from the beginning of the season if they can just keep this up, then it could be a surprise mm-hmm. stay of the season. And who knows who'd be that team that takes their spot in the relegation zone that we thought they would kind of secure there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I agree. I think Brentford have been a very surprising team out of the promoted sides to kind of watch because they're just really exciting, play with no fear, and just kind of go for it. But yeah, it was an exciting draw for sure for Liverpool um, finishing 3-3. And then, I guess, moving on to our final game, we have Manchester United versus Aston Villa, where Villa actually came into Old Trafford and upset uh, United 1-0. I think it was in the 88, 85th minute they scored. Um, and it was, I think, Konza that scored. Um, and it was a huge goal for them because, yeah, they they uh, they dominated Manchester United, I would say, for a majority of the second half. United looked you know, primarily flat for most of the second half. They played the McFred in midfield. Um, the service just wasn't there. Uh, the fluidity in the team was just kind of lacking. And it was a, just been a bad sh- couple of weeks for Manchester United because this is now their third defeat in four games where they lost the Young Boys, they lost to West Ham in the Carabao Cup, and now they've lost to Aston Villa. So a lot of question marks obviously have been pointed to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and you know, the team about being consistent because this is kind of the best team he's had with Manchester United. He's been backed now. Like, why can't he perform? at a high level in terms of coaching them consistently. You know, I think as we've seen, the Premier League is also a very hard league to master because we've seen teams, you know, Liverpool, they end up drawing against Brentford 3-3. But Villa have also kind of solidified themselves as a solid team, especially with the players they have. And they just got under Manchester United's skin. The Manchester United just were not able to play out from the back. They were not able to do anything. Luke Shaw and Harry Maguire went down with injuries. It looks like Harry Maguire will probably be out for the next couple of weeks with the calf injury. Luke Shaw is a little bit more hopeful that he can come back a little bit sooner, but huge injuries on their defensive side of the ball. And it was just a, it was just a poor display in general from a lot of the players. A lot of the players just, just had one of the, it was just one of those off days um, as you could say, but you know, when you're trying to challenge for the title, you can't have a lot of those off days. And unfortunately United had one really early in the season. Um, and hopefully I can, you know, I would hope that they kind of use this as a catalyst to kind of kick on for the season because they have started a little bit slow after that Leeds performance to open up the Premier League season. Their performances haven't really matched up with the results they've been getting. But hopefully, as we've seen, when Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is kind of under the pressure, it's kind of when his team kind of thrives the most, where the team plays with, I would say, the best of their abilities, where the players kind of just let loose and just play like themselves. So I don't know. Hopefully... 
Ole's got some of that magic juju still there, and then he can kind of help provide the team that spark they need because they're kind of lacking it right now. And I, hopefully they can kind of kick on because it's a little bit unfortunate with this results because it was just kind of a disappointing all-around afternoon. And, you know, the disappointment was kind of capped off when Bruno Fernandez had a penalty and it was between him or Ronaldo and Bruno ended up taking it. And he essentially didn't do his normal hop skip and just skied it over. It was the first time I've seen him miss a penalty like that. And, you know, that penalty miss just essentially just summarized Manchester United's performance that day. It was just not meant to be one of those days where it just was a terrible, terrible game for all, you know, for all people associated with Manchester United. And after the game, I wanted to kind of bring this up because it's been an interesting talking point among pundits and other people that, you know, follow football was the idea of, you know, not just Manchester United players, but players in general, after they make a mistake in a game or, you know, let's say there's a major mistake that leads to a goal or they miss a penalty, they miss an open goal, the team gets a loss. You'll usually see from most players, they'll come out on social media, put out a statement saying, oh, you know, we're sorry, like, you know, you got to keep moving forward. Or, you know, sometimes, you know, they may write on their notes, apologizing very deeply about something. And I know Bruno Fernandez, he posted a message, you know, apologizing for his miss and saying that, you know, it's just one of those days he's going to take full responsibility for it. And I know a lot of pundits, especially Gary Neville, he kind of was a little annoyed by that because he said he would prefer players if they're actually sorry, just go in front of the camera after the game just to say you're sorry or make the messages a video message where people can actually see your full emotions. Because as we all know, if you're a famous person, especially if you're a celebrity or a famous athlete, you most likely have a PR team behind you. And a lot of times, you know, most of the time, probably the PR team is the one crafting the messages for these players, but the players are the ones themselves posting it. But I don't know. I think it's one of those weird, the, the the day and age we're in right now, if the player doesn't post anything on social media, you, you'll have people, specifically a lot of these so-called fans on Twitter saying, oh, this person doesn't care about the club. They're just in it for the money. But if they do post about it, then you get slack from other people saying, oh, you know, what's wrong? It's like only a penalty miss. Like, why, like, why are you being so dramatic? I'm kind of in the middle of the two. I feel like unless it's super egregious, like it's a horrible mistake. I feel like, you know, if it's a missed penalty, it happens. You know, it's the beginning of the season. It's still a very long season. It happens. I know it was a big moment, but, you know, penalty misses happen. You just kind of have to live with it and move on. Um, so it doesn't, I feel like it doesn't necessarily need a super long message. And I don't know. I feel like now, I guess the day and age, it's kind of, especially for soccer players, especially in Europe, I feel like if you make any type of mistake, it's like they have to apologize on social media where they can't just like live with their own mistakes and kind of dwell with it. It's like they always have to make a message. And sometimes I feel like that could just kind of get almost in a sense, a little too PRE um, where you're just kind of looking like a public relations account. So I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of torn between the two. I understand why they have to do it, but I, I think there definitely needs to be a bit of a balance because any team you look at, whenever there's a mistake, the players are always like putting out these messages on social media. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point, just because also, yes, you work very closely with just social media for <laughs> your actual job. So yeah. like you'd have a pretty interesting perspective on that. And for me personally, I would say if I were a player, I know it's a little different nowadays that for social media is kind of forced on people. I think Bo Burham, like the comedian, kind of said it best where we're going to live in this era where we are kind of forced to be extroverted, even though you don't want to be. And for a lot of people, it's kind of hard. And for some people, it's pretty you know, helpful for them. It's pretty mutualistic kind of relationship with social media. But for professional players, professionals, and just famous people in general, where well, they have so many eyes on them on Twitter, on, you know, for the old people, Facebook, and <laughs> <laughs> everything from TikTok, Instagram, they have to kind of be public on everything. And I feel like if it were me, I would say, no, you don't have to post something if you messed up in a game. You know, you know what happens. Like if you miss a shot, you miss a penalty, you are the reason why the team lost from like a game mistake tackle or mistake mistake pass, something like that, like a draw slip, something like that. Then, mm -hmm. you know, just don't look at social media. That'd be my advice. It's like, don't even look. Like, don't even open your phone or anything. Just, you know, just get to work and then make it up the next game because that's all you can really do. Whereas, like, if you were just apologizing, it's just like just bad vibes. Just your entire, <laughs> your entire, 
page it's just sorry 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 and just from like different months because you know players will make mistakes and i feel like just kind of harping on it and just kind of apologizing for it is just gonna bring more attention to it and it, it kind of sucks in my opinion just that you know maybe it's not our generation but maybe just like generations after us that are kind of growing up with social media that they're gonna find this as kind of common where it's like yeah they should be apologizing it's like that's what we've always seen whereas if you rewind 12 15 18 years ago it was very few people that had social media it'd be like oh that guy has twitter what a nerd whereas now it's like everyone has social media everyone has instagram everyone has things like that and everyone basically has to use it at some points at, at least if yeah. you're like a big name so i think it's kind of like a consequence of the era we live in and it's it's a little rough because, you know, I'm I'm very much more kind of private. I would be like, you know, I made a mistake. I'm just not going to look at any social media because I know it's just going to be a lot of people roasting me. A lot of people being like, why do you even take the kick? And a lot of people just read it into it because, I mean, at least for me, I I even fell into it, too, where I was like, I saw Amy Martinez right before the penalty kind of look at Ronaldo and say, I want Ronaldo taking this penalty. I don't, I want Bruno Fernandez taking, I want Ronaldo to take it like against him. And that was that big mind game of having Bruno Fernandez kind of second guess is like, am I actually the true number one penalty kick taker for Manchester United? Or is it Ronaldo? Like, is, am I really the best choice? Mm -hmm. Like maybe he wasn't thinking that maybe he was, but that thought that even just sprinkled in his mind from Emmy Martinez, like that was some a (laughs) one, like, Mm -hmm mind games right there that's just that psychological game that you don't really get to see you can hear it you can just see him mouthing it emmy martinez just pointing at ronaldo just like give him the ball and that caused bruno to sky it and we saw emmy martinez kind of do these psychological mind games too against other teams in the copa america for argentina when they're in shootouts as well like emmy martinez is so good at saving penalties just because of that mind game kind of aspect and also his ability of course but it's a two-part mind game where it's like the confidence of the player taking it and the ability and the studying of just whether the, the goalie did his homework to know mm-hmm. which side, which spot of the goal is like the penalty kick taker's favorite spot. And all those little things, it's just now it's going to all come back. For Emmy Martinez, it's going to be like, you know, it's going to rise them up in the social media. It's like everyone on social media was like, man, they pointed out that mind game, that tactic that Emmy Martinez had. And it, it'd probably bring them up. Whereas now for Bruno Fernandez, it does the opposite where it's, it's like a balance. Like one, one side is going to get a lot of praise and the other side is going to get a lot of hate. And it's just going to be like a seesaw from here and there just because of social media. But I mean, that's just how it is these days. It is what it is, unfortunately, but that's how it is with social media. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's definitely weird because, you know, I, I, I gave my input on it, but as someone that, works in social media i obviously see the value of it but you know a lot of these players yeah you can tell some of some of the statements they put out are a little bit authentic but a lot of times you'll see a lot of players just put very generic you can tell they just ran it through a pr statement and it's just like what what you know what value does that really add it's like if jordan henderson you know liverpool get a big win he's just like solid performance with the team like you know does that really (laughs) add anything you know um or if it's like a big loss and you have players like cristiano ronaldo who obviously with his massive following needs to have a PR firm and it's like a loss and his statement is just like, Oh, bad result, but we have to keep pushing forward. You know, does it really add anything? I don't think so. And it's just a lot of those generic statements. I think some people now are kind of catching on to it because especially with abuse going around and like, you know, social media online with footballers, I just feel like, I feel like, like you said, I feel like footballers nowadays are just so, they're like, okay, if I make a mistake, now I got to craft a message on social media, like apologizing for my mistake. And if I don't, then it's just, I'm going to get called. Oh, I don't care for the club. I have no pride, no passion. So it's a double-edged sword that unfortunately the world we live in, you know, the social media does bring the, the players closer to the fans, but it also kind of has that downfall effect on the other side where it's, you know, now they're kind of forced into putting messages where sometimes it'd be better just to not say anything and just um, let your performances speak for themselves. But it is what it is, as Tyler said. And um, to wrap it all up, it was a poor display for Manchester United as a United fan. Pretty disappointing. But hopefully they can kick on and we won't have to mention this Aston Villa result because it was it was a pretty sad day to start my Saturday morning <laughs> uh, with the one no <laughs> loss. But, you know, we wanted to move in quickly to the preview section. We actually have a pretty decent 
good looking games for this weekend. You know, we don't have two, I would say, high profile blockbuster games, but we do have some pretty good ones. Um, to start it off, we have Manchester United versus Everton. If you didn't know, Rafa Benitez actually is doing some pretty solid work at Everton. He has Richarlison performing well, Andros Townsend. They're doing pretty well. I did not think they were going to do this well, especially uh, considering kind of the way they've been playing, losing Ancelotti, losing James. But, you know, they've been pretty solid. And Manchester United, even though they're back at Old Trafford, this is a huge game because they did not perform well against Aston Villa. They haven't performed well recently. So it's a big game to basically start off a very tough run of October fixtures for Manchester United. But I think they're going to have a little bit of a, a pep in their step, as we like to say, with Manchester City. I feel like they're going to have a little bit of an edge in this one because they know, the players on that team know that they can't lose this game. So I'm actually going to go 3-1 that they will win. I think it will be tough, but I, I feel like the star power will just carry them forward with this one to a 3-1 victory. I, I had faith in Rafa Benitez, for sure, just because he's a <laughs> Liverpool legend of a manager. He did really well just bringing Newcastle back from the grave, from the championship. And for an Everton side that's been kind of underachieving at times from the past several seasons with the players that you do have, I'm slightly surprised that they're in fifth, but I'm also not surprised that they're doing well under Rafa. But this is a big match for Rafa, and personally, because you know, as a former Liverpool manager, Manchester United has been a key rival for him for a while. And also, this would be a clear statement because this is fourth versus fifth in the table right now. Manchester United in fourth, Everton in fifth. So this would be a key in terms of what their intentions are and ambitions are to kind of kick down a Manchester United team that's already on the ground. They've been like, Manchester United have been, as yes has been mentioning, kind of like tripping <laughs> for the past three games. It's like it's like a very slow trip where it's like every game is like, one stumble after the other. And it's like, finally, it's Everton going to be the team that kind of kicks them down face flat. And they, I, I feel like they have the opportunity to, and they're going to take a full advantage of it. I don't know if Ronaldo, given that at times at, under, at Juve in the past couple seasons, sometimes they can't make that comeback as, you know, you would see Ronaldo would. And it's kind of been suffering a little bit at Manchester United, surprisingly, just a lot of one nils against them. So I wouldn't be surprised if Everton just stack another one to that list. Another 1-0 for Everton. You would never hear me say Everton's going to win a game, but these two are basically wow. rival teams of Liverpool. But right now, just in terms of momentum, I, I feel like it's got to be Everton. Wow. Okay, so that's a big result. You're going for 1-0 Everton win. I, I think United will bounce back with 3-1 win, so we got two opposite results there. So that's that'll be interesting. Um, and then mm -hmm. we have West Ham versus Brentford. We mentioned Brentford earlier. In the episode, how they kind of play with no fear. They're very exciting. West Ham are kind of the same way where they, under David Moyes, have been with Mikel Antonio. They have a very solid team around them. But I think this will be an exciting game. I think it will actually end up being a 2-2 draw with these two teams. I have a lot of recency bias because of Brentford. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on the Brentford bandwagon now. But this is also a pretty close matchup as well. They're seventh for West Ham versus ninth Brentford. And... For West Ham, they came into the season of expectations. Whereas Brentford, they have no expectations. That's why they're playing so brave, so bravely. And these two tactics are kind of clashing almost. Whereas like Brentford's basically just like gung ho. And West Ham hmm, is well, they're a little bit more structured, I would say, under David Moyes, but it's still pretty attacking for a West Ham side that we've kind of seen in the past several seasons kind of more laid back. But this game, I I would agree with you. It's going to be a two-two. It's going to be slightly dependent because I, I know Mikel Antonio is kind of in and out of the starting lineup more recently because of I believe injuries. But I think if it could be a Mikel Antonio versus Ivan Tony kind of situation, I could see a two-two because those two leading the front by either team is going to be pretty exciting. Nice, nice two-two. So we're both going for the uh, two-two draw there, and then finally we have the biggest game of the weekend, which is Liverpool City. Um, at Anfield, a huge one because I remember last season City came into Anfield and rocked Liverpool. I mean, obviously no fans in the stadium, but they did dominated them in that game. But this one's a lot different. Uh, Liverpool are coming in with a lot of momentum right now. Um, Manchester City coming in, decent momentum, especially in the Premier League at least. But ooh, this, this will be a tough one. I actually think that City can go into this, uh, go into Anfield. I think they could win a 2-1 victory. I actually think City could pull off the victory here, so I'm going 2-1 City. Liverpool's defense recently has been 
what's the word? Sus. <laughs> it's been <laughs> not the solid kind of typical Liverpool defense that you would see under Klopp with these players. Like you would think, oh, they came back with Van Dyke, Matip, Joe Gomez. Everyone's back. No, there's no injuries. Trent's back. Robertson's back. The whole the whole gang's back. But yeah. from the season, minus the Brentford game, they've only conceded one goal. So in terms of recency bias, it's like, yeah, the, the defense is in kind of shambles. But if you look at the kind of evidence beforehand, it looks like they have everything back under control. So it's you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know what kind of tail is gonna is gonna pop up. You know, Liverpool we're recording this on the Tuesday of September twenty eighth. And, you know, Liverpool just beat Porto 5-1. But, and that's like another sample. It's like, all right, is their defense actually good? I'm going to be on the more hesitant side. I'm going to say Man City do have the slight advantage going into this game. And just in terms of just form alone and the fact that Liverpool's defense is kind of hit or miss. But I I can't see one of the teams winning. I, I want to say a 1-1. <laughs> It's Dang. it's kind of rare to get a draw between these two in the past few seasons, but I think it might kind of stall out, kind of like the Chelsea Liverpool game. Mm. Yeah, I will say though that both these teams they do like to attack, so at least they we'll do. hopefully get if it does end in a draw. Hopefully we get an exciting one one. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, but I'm sweating already. <laughs> <laughs> this this a... one this one's gonna be a really fun game because. As we mentioned, these are two of the top dogs of the Premier League, at least for the past couple of seasons. These two have been neck and neck for the Premier League title race. So I'm excited. I'm actually, I'm going, like I said before, I'm going 2-1 City. Tyler's going with a 1-1 draw. So we'll see what happens. It'll, it'll be an mm-hmm. exciting game for sure. But that wraps up episode 126 for us. As we always say, you can follow us at the Premier Pod on Instagram and Twitter. You can give us a follow on there. Send us any questions you would like for the show. We'd be happy to answer them or actually talk about them for the next episode or any upcoming episodes. You can also watch the video version of the podcast at the Premier Pod on YouTube. Subscribe to us on there if you want to catch the video version of the podcast. And if you do listen to Apple Podcasts, if you would like to leave us a rating or review, that helps us out and gets us boosted and helps us get notified or seen across other podcast platforms and other people that listen to it but if you don't want to leave a review um we're more than happy with that we love the support if you want to share it with a friend um or share with anyone else that's interested in the premier league we'd greatly appreciate it and gets more uh gets more ears to the pod so we appreciate it um we appreciate all the support and everyone that's listened throughout the uh, four years we've been doing it so appreciate it and yeah that kind of wraps up season four episode 126 for us thank you guys so much peace peace